distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and a very warm welcome to the RSIS Embassy of Peru panel webinar on Peru and Singapore, enhancing ties across the Pacific Ocean. Good evening too to our friends on the other side of the world in Latin America. I'm Nazia Hussein from RSIS and I have the pleasure to be your MC today. Before we start the event, please note that this webinar will be recorded and it may be publicly shared online. I'd now like to invite Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, Executive Deputy Chairman of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies to deliver the welcome remarks. Ambassador Ong, please. Thank you all for joining this seminar online. I would like to bid a special welcome to our friends from Peru and Ms. Sin M, Senior Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of Singapore. This is a special year for Peru as it celebrates the bicentennial of its independence. On behalf of S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, as well as all our Singaporean friends of Peru, a very warm congratulations and good wishes to friends from Peru as you celebrate your bicentennial. Singapore and Peru have excellent relations. For example, we are in APEC, that is the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. We are also part of the CPTPP, Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. In recent years, we have worked together to negotiate a free trade agreement between the Pacific Alliance and Singapore. Pacific Alliance is a major economic group in Central and South America, consisting of Peru, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico. These cooperative efforts between the two countries have become even more pertinent now in the face of challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has severe impact on our respective societies and economies. Today, we will hear speeches from the two ministers, Ambassador Higaras from Peru and Ms. Sim M from Singapore. After that, we will have three experts to talk about the value of economic multilateralism. Economic multilateralism is deemed to be under heavy pressure today because of geopolitics, mistrust, and rivalries among different countries. When we speak about economic multilateralism, the world Trade Organization, WTO, comes into mind. The WTO is gearing up for its 12th ministerial conference scheduled to take place at the end of November this year. We hope the WTO and its members will work together for the benefit of the global community, especially as all of us struggle to get out of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are many things I wish to say about APEC, about the progressive, uh, comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, as well as the future agreement between Singapore and the Pacific Alliance. But we have the experts here, so I think it is fair to let the expert say what they have to say instead of me boring you with all the nitty gritty. But the most important thing I will leave you in my opening remarks is that Singapore looks forward to more cooperation and strengthening of the 
economic multilateralism, which is the basis of the global trade system. We all need cooperation and strengthening of economic multilateralism. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to hand over the screen to our ministerial speaker. Back to you, Nazia. Thank you, Ambassador Ong. Ambassador Ignacio Rigueras, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Peru, will now deliver his opening remarks via recorded video. It is my honor to address you on the special occasion of the webinar Peru and Singapore, enhancing ties across the Pacific Ocean, which gathers us today. It is a privilege to participate in this event along with a group of distinguished professionals to exchange ideas about the nature and dynamics of the bilateral relationship between Peru and Singapore in the context of the current unprecedented international landscape. I highly appreciate the participation and the opportunity to share this event with Her Excellency Mrs. Sim An, Senior Minister of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of National Development of Singapore, His Excellency Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, Executive Deputy Chairman of the RSIS and Ambassador at Large at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Singapore, Ambassador Carlos Vasquez Corrales, Ambassador of Peru to Singapore, Dr. Rebecca Fatima Santa Maria, Executive Director at the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Secretariat, Mr. Peter Govidasami, Dean of the Ministry of Trade and Industry Academy of Singapore, Dr. Carlos Aquino Rodriguez, Director of the Center of Asian Studies at Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos of Peru, and of course, all of you, dear participants. I would also like to express my gratitude to the Raharatnam School of International Studies, recognized as one of the most renowned institutions dedicated to the analysis of international affairs in Southeast Asia. Just as in 2019, Singapore celebrated the bicentennial of its foundation, so in 2021, the Republic of Peru commemorates the bicentennial of its independence. For that reason, this year is particularly relevant to encourage a deep and critical reflection by Peruvians about how to build a better country in the coming years. In this regard, I believe that such exercise of reflection can also come from a foreign policy perspective, because the bicentennial symbolizes an opportunity to foster the cooperation ties with our friends around the world, such as Singapore in the Asia Pacific region. On 27 October 1980, the governments of Peru and Singapore officially established bilateral diplomatic relations. In those days, Peru was bent on reinforcing its links with Asian countries located on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, a decision which was spurred by the creation in 1989 of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, APEC. In 1998, Peru joined APEC and it opened a brilliant perspective of promoting free and open trade and investment in the Asia Pacific region. This new strategy of the Peruvian diplomacy served as a catalyzer for guiding Peru's foreign policy towards Asia. But Peru does not only share with Singapore the defense of the principle of free trade and a global commercial system based on rules. We share similar values in terms of the promotion of peace and cooperation the support of multilateralism and international law. At the beginning of 2021, we reaffirmed these values when both countries organized the second meeting of the bilateral consultation mechanism of the level of foreign ministries in the context of the 40th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations. On that occasion, we reviewed the evolution of our bilateral agenda in the last four decades and decided to reinforce our links in a new field such as science and technology, innovation, digital economy, digital government, and cooperation in health to overcome the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the economic field, one of our milestones of our bilateral relation has been the free trade agreement that we signed in 2008 during Prime Minister Lee Hsien-Lung's participation in the APEC summit in Lima. Since the STA, 
Bilateral trade has risen at an average annual rate of 23%. Moreover, thanks of, to the FT8, a growing number of companies based in Singapore have been involved in proven projects in sectors such as energy, fisheries, agribusiness, mining, and maritime services. In 2018, our country signed an air service agreement to enhance connectivity between them. In addition, Peru is interested in joining the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, recently promoted by Singapore and other countries. At the multilateral level, Peru and Singapore have maintained similar positions on issues such as climate change, the upholding of intellectual property rights, and the fight against drug traffic. With regards to unprecedented challenges posed by the pandemic of COVID-19, I would like to underscore that Peru and Singapore participate in the Alliance for Multilateralism to promote effective cooperation for a timely, equitable, and universal access to vaccines and treatments. Another pillar for fostering our bilateral relation is our current negotiations for Singapore to become the first associate state of the Pacific Alliance. As you know, the Pacific Alliance is an integration initiative which compromises Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, aiming to enhance free trade and investment with the Asia Pacific region. Undoubtedly, the admission of Singapore will represent a landmark for the reinforcement of bilateral links between our countries and entails the potential of turning Peru into Singapore's gateway to the rest of the Latin American region. Given Latin America's status as a global food supplier, the Pacific Alliance could help shore up Singapore's food security. Dear participants, while Peru and Singapore are geographically far apart, there are strong foundations that will continue resonating with the people of our nations. Let us build upon the, those foundations to construct more bridges of friendship and cooperation. I wish you all a very fruitful exchange of views I strongly believe the discussion promoted by this webinar will bring about new avenues and possibilities to enrich even more the excellent relations between Peru and Singapore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Igueras. We now invite Ms. Sim An, Senior Minister of State for Foreign Affairs and National Development of Singapore to deliver her opening remarks. Senior Minister of State, please. His Excellency. Ambassador Carlos Raul Vasquez Corrales, Republic mm -hmm. of Peru to Singapore. Ambassador at large, Ong Kim Yong, Executive Deputy Chairman of RSIS. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you and buenas noches to those who are joining us from Peru. It is my honor to join you in commemorating the bicentennial of Peru's independence. I extend my warmest congratulations to the government and people of Peru on this auspicious occasion. Peru has a rich and long heritage dating back to the Incan peoples. Today, it has become a vibrant democracy, representing its diverse ethnic communities with a thriving and open economy. On the international stage, Peru has been a strong supporter of the rules based multilateral system. Plays an active role in international discussions on areas such as free trade, sustainable development, and environmental conservation in the Amazon. Singapore and Peru enjoy a warm and productive relationship. Outwardly, we may differ in size and history and are separated by the Pacific Ocean. But Singapore and Peru share many similarities, which has set the foundation of our bilateral relations and cooperation over the last four decades. We are both trading nations and embrace the idea of open and inclusive regional architecture. We also believe in the importance of a rules-based international system that provides stability in the international environment and is conducive to economic growth and development. Singapore and Peru have therefore worked together to promote economic integration and cooperation across the Pacific. Singapore and Peru are partners in the Forum for East Asia Latin American Cooperation, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC Forum, and the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans Pacific Partnership. Singapore also welcomes Peru's efforts to engage ASEAN, notably Peru's accession to the Treaty of Amity 
and cooperation in Southeast Asia in 2019. We have kept up a steady momentum of high-level interactions. First Vice President Admiral Lewis A. Giampietri Rojas made an official visit to Singapore in November 2006. Prime Minister Lee Hsien visited Peru in 2008 and 2016 in conjunction with the APEC Economic Leaders Meeting. Our trade ministers signed on the Peru Singapore Free Trade Peru's first FTA with the Asian country in 2008. Bilateral trade has been on an upward progression since the Peru Singapore FTA came into force in 2009. Our investments in Peru have grown to 1.36 billion Singapore dollars in 2019, making Peru our fourth largest investment destination in Latin America. There is still scope for us to do more. The Pacific Alliance Singapore Free Trade Agreement, or the PASFTA, which reached a substantial conclusion last December, is the next milestone in our bilateral relationship. The PASFTA will enhance trade and deepen cooperation in emerging areas such as the digital economy, energy sector, and infrastructure. It is strategically between two sides of the Pacific, which will help deepen Singapore's relations with Peru and the Pacific Alliance partners. Our negotiators have worked tirelessly to bring us close to the finishing line. Singapore looks forward to signing the PSFTA this year. It will send a timely signal to the global community that our countries remain open for business and continue to welcome trade and investments to spur economic growth and post-pandemic economic recovery. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, Singapore and Peru have continued to work together. The Tomasic Foundation has contributed COVID-19 test kits and ventilators to Peru. I'm happy that in January this year, we were able to commemorate by a video conference the 40th anniversary of diplomatic relations at the bilateral consultations hosted by Minister for Foreign Affairs, Dr. Vivian Balakrishna, and Indian Foreign Ministry Secretary General Francisco Tenya. The consultations were a good opportunity to take stock of our bilateral milestones and the chart course for the next chapter. Singapore looks forward to the next chapter, embarking on new areas of cooperation with Peru and further growing our bilateral relations. I wish you productive discussions this morning. Congratulations again to Peru and its people on the 200th anniversary of Peru's independence. Thank you, Senior Minister of State. We will now invite the panelists to deliver their presentations. On the panel today, we have Mr. Peter Govindasamy, Dean of the MTI Academy at the Ministry of Trade and Industry of Singapore and Chief Negotiator for Singapore for the Pacific Alliance Singapore Free Trade Agreement, Dr. Carlos Aquino, Director of the Center for Asian Studies at the Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos in Peru, and Dr. Rebecca Fatima Santa Maria, Executive Director of the APEC Secretariat. Moderating the panel will be Ambassador Ong. But before we begin, please note that you can post your questions via the Q&A function. The chat and the raise hand functions are disabled. Without further ado, let us welcome Mr. Peter Govindasamy to deliver his presentation. Mr. Govindasamy, please. Vice Minister Igaras, Senior Minister of State, uh, Sin An, Ambassador Ong, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Peter Govindasamy, Singapore's Chief Negotiator for the Pacific Alliance Singapore FTA. Let me join everyone in congratulating Peru on the bicentennial of its independence. We also celebrate the excellent bilateral relationship between Peru and Singapore. It is an honor, indeed an honor, to speak at this August webinar. My comments will be structured in three clusters. First, the negotiating process. Second, the key aspects of the FTA. And third, on associate membership. Peru played an important role in the Pacific Alliance Singapore FTA negotiations. Notably, the scoping of the FTA process was done and adopted in Lima in September 2017. The first round took place in Cali, Colombia in October 2017. Over the past four years, the Pacific Alliance and Singapore have collaboratively, collaboratively had 12 physical negotiating rounds. 
This was followed by 34 video conferences at the level of chief negotiators since September 2020. We kept the momentum during the COVID situation. The intensive negotiating process conducted on a weekly basis enabled the Pacific Alliance and Singapore to reach substantial conclusion at the virtual Pacific Alliance Summit in December 2020. As of today, I am pleased to mention that we are at the verge of fully concluding the negotiations. At the same time, the Pacific Alliance and Singapore have taken the practical approach of launching the legal scrubbing of the FTA tax at our meeting last week. The Pacific Alliance and Singapore are preparing the FTA for signature at the Pacific Alliance Summit in Colombia later this year. Let me now uh, briefly highlight the key aspects of the FTA. First, the FTA builds on the WTO. The FTA is WTO plus. The Pacific Alliance Singapore FTA augments the rules-based multilateral trading system. Second, the FTA complements Singapore's existing bilateral and prolateral agreements with the Pacific Alliance states, namely the P4, Peru-Singapore FTA, and the CPTPP. Third, the FTA is a modern and comprehensive agreement spanning various trade and trade-related matters. The agreement caters to today's business needs and contemporary realities. Fourth, there are a number of chapter, chapters that complement the traditional areas of trade in goods, services, and investment. Some examples are the chapters relating to the promotion of small and medium-sized enterprises, good regulatory practices for trade and investment, and e-commerce. Fifth, a first for Singapore is the chapter on international maritime transport services. This chapter relates to enhancing connectivity between the Pacific Alliance and Singapore and our respective regions. The maritime chapter speaks to the matter of people-to-people -people exchanges. If I can cite one example, and I, uh, what there's a provision that uh, calls upon the promotion of exchange of students between the academic merchant maritime trading centers of the parties. In sum, the FTA sends a powerful message to the global community that our countries, Peru, the Pacific Alliance, and Singapore remain open for business. Despite the pressures placed on economic multilateralism, all of us have reached out to one another. Through the FTA, we want to build resilient supply chains, create more opportunities for our people, support good jobs, and improve the quality of lives in our countries and regions. Another first and innovative dimension of this FTA is that Singapore will become the first associate member of the Pacific Alliance upon the signature of the FTA. We are excited by this prospect in Singapore. Associate membership would allow the Pacific Alliance and Singapore to explore economic cooperation in areas beyond the FTA. Some potential partnerships include energy collaboration, such as in hydrogen and carbon credits, food trade, the Pacific Alliance states dovetails with our effort to diversify our food sources, digital economy, infrastructure and smart cities, and port management and logistics. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pacific Alliance and Singapore are indeed partners in globalization. Last week, the Pacific Alliance embassies, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and MTI organized a seminar to mark the 10th anniversary of the Pacific Alliance. The seminar acknowledged that at a time when protectionist and anti-globalization sentiments are challenging the global economy, the Pacific Alliance and Singapore remain a champion for free and open trade. The seminar also highlighted the shared vision of Peru, the Pacific Alliance and Singapore to strengthen the rules-based system, grow economic trade and investment and serve as nodes in our respective regions, and most importantly, energize people-to-people -people ties. This leads to my last slide with, for, with a quote by the famous Spanish poet, Antonio Machado, who said, Traveler, there is no path. The path is made by walking. This is apt. The Pacific Alliance and Singapore built the FTA road over the past four years of our negotiations. We look forward to developing the associate membership highway. Our vision is for the Pacific Alliance Singapore FTA and associate membership to serve as expressways to go faster and further with the Pacific Alliance. It is appropriate that I conclude with a 
Peruvian proverb, which says, little by little, one walks far. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mr. Govindasamy. May I now invite Dr. Carlos Aquino to deliver his presentation. Dr. Aquino, please. Hello, everybody. I am uh, really honored to be in this uh, webinar. I want to thank uh, the uh, S. Rajaratman School of International Studies of Nagyante Law American University and the Embassy of Peru or Singapore for inviting me. I will share my slide. I think you are seeing it, okay? I will uh, talk about the uh, perspective on the comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is the line of my presentation. Uh, what is the present situation of the CPTPP? As we know, the CPTPP, also called the TPP-11, has 11 members, seven from the Asian side of the Pacific and four in the American continent, okay? We have Australia, Brunei, uh, Japan, Malaysia, New Zealand, Singapore, and Vietnam in the Asia side, and we have Canada, Chile, Mexico, and Peru in the American side. It is uh, worth to know that uh, this uh, agreement includes uh, members specifically in the Asian side, countries that have been growing at the very fast rate in the last 40, 50 years, okay? As we know, this uh, agreement was signed on March uh, 2018, but actually of the 11 members of this agreement, the agreement is, is in force in effect for only uh, seven of them, okay? From December 30, 2080, it is in effect for Australia, Canada, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, and Singapore. And uh, from January 14, 2020, it is uh, in effect for Vietnam. What about of the remaining four countries? Uh, in the case of Peru, for example, on June 11 this year, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Peru sent to the Congress the document for the approval of the CPTPP. Uh, uh, the present Congress of Peru is finishing its duties in, at the end of this month because we have had a uh, general election. We have chosen a new president and a new Congress. I don't think that in the remaining of this month it will be approved. So the approval, the ratification of this uh, agreement will be the task of the next Congress. I hope uh, uh, approval will come soon. In the case of Chile, for example, we, we came to know that in the year 2019, the lower house of the Congress of Chile approved it. But then it went to the Senate and uh, it still uh, have not moved from there. So we don't know yet when it will be uh, approved in the case of Chile. In the case of Malaysia, I think still the federal government is doing consultation with the state government about the ratification of this agreement. And in the case of Brunei, there have been no new, no new news about this agreement being ratified, okay? So this is the picture of the ceremony, singing ceremony. And uh, uh, what about the impact of the uh, CPTPP? Uh, what are the effects on, on the member countries and on the world economy? First, we have to remember that the, the CPTPP is one of the major trade agreements in the world. It covers 30% of the global gross domestic product and about 15% of global trade. Also, we have to remember that the TPP-11 is uh, the most advanced trade regional agreement in the world because it, it has a, a very extensive liberalization of commerce and investment. It is said that 95% or even 99% of barriers will be abolished in trade among the members of them. But uh, as we said, only uh, this uh, agreement having in, in effect for two years for six of the countries and just uh, one year for one country, okay? So anyway, what can be said about this agreement? First, uh, as you know, the CPTPP is one of the major uh, uh, regional trade agreements in the world. Uh, uh, you see in this graphic, uh, what is the uh, importance of the CPTPP 
PTPP in terms of gross domestic product and trade in the world, okay? And also in, you can see in the right side, how much the percentage of member total trade is done in the, in the interregional trade agreement, trade base, okay? And uh, uh, we know, for example, that uh, this is CPTPP, have uh, touched several areas that are not included in many agreements. For example, just to mention three of them, for example, the uh, chapter 17 of a state-owned enterprise, the chapter 19, and the chapter 20, for example. Really? So these are issues that are not touched in, in several other uh, agreements. For example, the just uh, signed regional comprehensive economic partnership does not touch in these three areas. Okay, So it is a, a WTO plus agreement. It is the most broader and deeper agreement so far signed. Okay? Anyway, it is not easy, in fact, to evaluate the impact of the CPTPP on trade world for two reasons. One, it has been said because it is not in effect for the 11 country members, only for seven of them, and for six years, they have been effect two years, and Vietnam only from last year. And also, uh, as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, affected so much, uh, causes so much disruption in world trade economy also in the world. So it is not easy to evaluate. Anyway, something that can be said by sure is that uh, one of the biggest achievements of the CPTPP is that have raised interest in other countries to join it. We will talk a little more about this after that. Also, it could be said that the signing of the TPP living have in a sense accelerated the signing of the RCP on November uh, 15, 2020. It is said, for example, that the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and China were eager to, to sign this uh, agreement. Okay. Anyway, uh, yes, uh, we show in this figure how have been the, the situation of the economies of the, the CPTT members in the last two years, 2019 and 2020. You, we can see here we have Australia, we have Brunei, we have Canada, we have Chile, we have Japan, we have uh, Malaysia, we have uh, New Zealand, Mexico, Peru, uh, Singapore, and Vietnam. And we have uh, seen that in the last, in the year 2020, most of the economies in the world uh, experienced a negative world, but in the case of the CPTPP members, two countries achieved a positive world. One is Vietnam and another is Brunei. Okay. Anyway, all, all countries suffer a lot because of the situation in the world economy was bad. Okay. Also, regarding uh, the growth in the merchandise export, uh, all member countries achieved in the year 2020 uh, negative growth, except Vietnam. Okay. Except Vietnam. Even as uh, we have, uh, we see here, there have been a slowdown in the export of goods in for all these countries, okay? And this is due to the uh, fact that in, in the last year, you can see here very clearly, that in the last four years, the uh, world economy has been uh, decreasing in its growth and also the uh, merchandise trade, okay? And as we know, the Asian countries, uh, especially, and, but also Peru, Chile, Mexico, Canada are, uh, very much dependent on export, especially we say that the Asian countries are, the engine of their growth is the export, okay? So the economic situation in the world has not been good, so that's why it is said that the, also the CPP, CPTPP members have uh, slowed down the economic growth and trade, okay? But anyway, as we see here, even if the Asian countries, especially Asian countries that are most of the members of the CPTPP, have experiencing a slowdown or falling in, in trade growth uh, last year, they are they will be the uh, fastest to recover. Okay, so this is, you you can see here the projection of the WTO. So the, the Asian countries uh, they will be the faster to recover, and not say uh, regarding uh, merchandising. Okay. Anyway, uh, also we can say that the uh, Asian, especially CPP countries have been more resilient to the slowdown of the world economy. 
But anyway, what is needed, I think it is that this uh, effort of trade and investment liberalization in the world of which the CPTPP is the standard period is maintained. Okay, we know, for example, that the, one of the key reasons for the development, the fast development of Asian countries is that they have uh, <coughs> took advantage of the open trade and investment environment that have been uh, uh, observed in the last three, four decades in the world economy. So this is a precondition for CPP, CPTPP members also to fund. But I will say something, okay? For example, especially in the case of Latin America, uh, we know, for example, especially Chile and Peru, we are still are so much dependent in the export of uh, raw materials. So we need to get more involved in the value chain, okay? I guess I showed you a, a, a graphic where it is seen that in the case of Peru and Chile, they are in the sidelines, we can say, of the global value chain, okay? Compared, for example, Mexico that is involved in the global chain, the North American region, and of course, the Asian countries, okay? So in order for Peru and Chile to take more advantage of the CPTPP and all this agreement, we need, for example, to put more value added to our commodities. And in that case, we need a kind of industrial policy or some effort of the government and the private sector to get more involved and to take more advantage of the CPTPP. For example, in order to do more interregional trade, okay? Because we know interregional trade in many agreements, it is inter-industry interregional trade, okay? Anyway, what about new members? It is interesting to note that on 2nd June this year, the accession process began for the United Kingdom. So it is estimated that perhaps in one year, one year and a half, we, the CPPT will have a new member, the United Kingdom. And, and we know that the United Kingdom was very easy, but, but very eager, sorry, to enter because uh, they left the European Union. So they, they need new markets, okay? Also, uh, for the CPTPP, it is very good to have the uh, United Kingdom as a member because uh, as it said in the uh, welcoming uh, statement regarding the U United Kingdom uh, entry, they said that this provide a unique uh, opportunity to advance the CPTPP high standard rules for the 21st century and further promote free trade open and competitive markets and economic integration in the Asia Pacific region and beyond. Beside the United Kingdom, of course, we have a, a, a declaration from a person from government officer from South Korea, Thailand, Philippines, Taiwan, even China, expressing interest in joining the, uh, the group. China will be a very interesting case, but I think it is not realistic now to expect China to join the CPTPP because the, of the highest standards uh, uh, that the CPTPP CPTP has, okay? Perhaps the most interesting case is the United States. United States was supposed to be a, a, one of the 12 signatories in the original TPP, but the, we know the Trump administration take out the United States from the agreement. But uh, it is very interesting to note that, uh, for example, during the Obama administration, United States participation in the CPTP was, or the TPP, sorry, then, was one of the key ingredients of his famous pivot to Asia policy, really. The United States was looking for rebalance in the Asia Pacific, uh, uh, the Asia Pacific. And I remember that uh, on 2015, for example, the then uh, Secretary, uh, United States Defense Secretary Ash Carter said that the TPP is as important for the United States as having another aircraft carrier <laughs> in the Pacific, okay? What are the perspectives of United States joining the uh, CPTPP. I, I don't think it is realistic to expect in the short term, the Biden administration have more urgent issues. And what's last thing? The Trade Promotion Authority that they allow the United States government or, or the, uh, the government to negotiate have expired already on, on, on July 1st. So they don't have the tool to conduct the fast uh, uh, negotiation. Okay. Yes, I want to finish saying that uh, the CPTPP the CPTPP should be in the forefront in the objective achieving trade and investment liberalization in the world, okay? Especially what is needed after, uh, for, for a full recovery of the world economy is the maintenance of this uh, open trade and investment liberalization that have been uh, very good for the development of the Asian region. That will be all. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Aquino. We'd now like to invite Dr. Rebecca Santa Maria to deliver her presentation. Dr. Santa Maria, please. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, uh, RSIS, and especially the Embassy of Peru for this very kind invitation to share some of my thoughts on um, where we are in APEC and the role that Peru has, uh, has been playing in APEC. Uh, let, me, let me start by sharing my slides. Give me a second. It's, it's always you know, one of these things that we have to do huh? uh, in this new normal, <laughs> learning how to share our slides. Let me go. Right. Thank you again. Um, let, me, let me just uh, recap how I intend to do this presentation. First, the question of does APEC matter? And for this, I will uh, draw your attention to a perception survey that the Secretariat conducted last year with uh, the help of Edelman. And then I will recap the 2020 outcomes, the Putrajaya Vision 2040, APEC 21 priorities, and then the deliverables and follow-up this year. Does APEC matter? I think this, this is an interesting, like I said, we did this perception survey and we surveyed about 7,600 uh, uh, folks from across the region. And uh, you know, it was interesting for us to see how the, the feedback was that it does matter. Um, overwhelmingly, 23% out of uh, the total agreed uh, that, that APEC was you know, one of the most mentioned organizations when we talk of promoting economic cooperation in the region. Uh, but more interesting is the fact that Peru, it, among the Peruvians, it was, they were above the APEC average of 30%. So that's, that's an interesting. Um, moving on, we also asked whether people were familiar with multilateral institutions. And well, of course, you know, United Nations uh, was right up there and APEC was not too far behind. And we asked about, um, let me just let me just do this. Let me just go back. Yeah, let me just go. Uh, the support for for what is what do you think APEC is is really important for? And overwhelmingly, the the aspect of free and open trade and interconnected uh, global economy kept coming up. And let me move on. And again, you know the. The importance, what we saw was the importance of ensuring um, the, the cooperation among economies. This, this was one that, that kept coming up. So clearly what we're getting from the feedback was that APEC is, is significant and that international regional cooperation is important during this, this time of COVID and that not one economy can go it alone. Um, move on and let me just go back to the issue of multilateralism and it was mentioned a few times and here we see that the respondents from Peru have more confidence in multilateralism when you compare that with the APEC average 92 percent compared with the APEC average of 84 percent so really folks believe that you know in a, in a time of pandemic we have to work together and it is not about you know, nationalism and going it alone. Um, going back to APEC and the work that we've been doing to in, in 2020, that was a pivotal year for us in that that was the first time we had to change the way we worked. We couldn't meet physically halfway through the, well, almost a quarter of the way through the year, we, you know, COVID hit us big time and we couldn't meet physically. So we had to learn to meet to use the virtual environment to keep to keep going on with the 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 task ahead, and to we and 2020 was also the year when the BOGO goals for us of free and open trade was you know ending, and so we we had to think about and reflect about where did we see APEC going, and this is where we worked through this very challenging period to draw up the next phase of regional economic integration for the region. And the result was the APEC Putrajaya Vision 2040. And this initiative was not just the policy makers getting together and drawing up a vision. Uh, we harnessed the, the, the feedback from the APEC Vision Group, which was an independent group of, of folks. We, we looked at the feedback from the APEC Business Advisory Council 
and PAC, the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council. So we gathered feedback from all these folks and then worked through so that we get to um, a better, better appreciation of where we saw APEC going in the in the coming years, and last uh, in and last year also we focused on um, APEC's response. We had that reality, that challenge of focusing on the response to the pandemic. Um, we had a num number of key outcomes. One, we realized that you know, as we said, we could not go this go, go about this alone. So how do we engage each other? How do we make sure that you know, we support each other. And this is where we, APEC, APEC strength is in sharing best practices in, in uh, technical cooperation. So we came up with the um, latest and immediate virtual exchange campaign site. And in this site, we have, um, we have captured all the initiatives that we've done to help us cope and manage the pandemic. Uh, for example, how do we support supply chains for essential goods? How do we uh, focus on um, secure access to vaccines? How do we facilitate the essential movement of people? Uh, what are we doing in, in, um, in, on the uh, area of transparency for COVID-19 response? Uh, what kind of analysis are we doing on, on COVID-19 response and recovery? What are we doing to build resilience and inclusion in the APEC economy? So these are the six key areas that we worked on and, and the initiatives, the ongoing work is captured in this uh, campaign site, which is on our website. Uh, we also worked, and this is again ongoing, declaration on facilitating the movement of essential goods. Um, a lot of discussion, a lot of work, and the difference between APEC and ASEAN or the EU is that we are non-binding. So what we do is best endeavor. We put, we, we have these discussions on the work that we're doing and best endeavor basis for economies to implement. And the sharing of the best practices and the, the outcomes that each economy derives from these uh, initiatives is what really you know, helps us move along. And another area that, that is working that we started last year and we're continuing this year is the initiative to review measures on facilitating essential movement of people across borders. Uh, I must say Singapore played a key role in this. Uh, the Singapore Business Ad us, APEC Business Advisory Council members um, worked with us uh, to have these roundtables to, to engage experts to see how we can um, what we can do, what more we can do to ensure that we can safely open our borders. Now, this is, this is a challenge and we've had a, one big round of, of discussions and we're hoping to have another one in, in the near future. So there's a lot of work in this area. And um, last year also, we saw the uh, various uh, declarations you know, and the, the vision that we put together is WTO consistent. It aims to move further WTO plus. We aim for free and open, fair, non-discriminatory uh, trading environment, trading investment environment, um, intensifying economic and technical cooperation, which is a strength of APEC. And interesting aspect of the new vision is the focus on the digital, sustainable and inclusive growth. Um, here's, a nut, in a nutshell, what we hope to achieve through this new vision. We have a vision of an open, dynamic, resilient, peaceful Asia-Pacific community. Uh, very importantly, it's for the prosperity of our people and future generations. I think that, that encapsulates a lot of the work that we are doing in terms of inclusive growth. In, last year, we, we had a lot of discussions on beyond GDP. We questioned ourselves whether GDP was a fair measure of what um, well-being is for the region. So the, the, in the vision, we try and further this conversation, looking at, yes, trade, investment, excellent for growth, but more importantly, for inclusive growth. And the drivers for the vision trade and investment, which is our bread and butter, then innovation and digitalization. And the third driver is really what will make a difference, the strong, balanced, secure, sustainable, and inclusive growth. And uh, this year, New Zealand as host economy has 
has its steam, join, work, grow together. And you know, it's very interesting how they use the analogy of building a waka, the Maori canoe. This, the building of that canoe itself requires the holy a community, it's not an individual effort. And that in a sense encapsulate what we're doing in APEC. It is not an individual economy working, but really all of us working together to further trade and investment to expand. And more importantly, the inclusiveness of, of the work that we're doing going forward. And uh, New Zealand's priorities are trade and investment policies to strengthen recovery. Really the, the focus this year on recovery, increasing inclusion and sustainability. So there will be, there's there's much discussion on how do we bring in and make sure that everything that we're doing brings benefits to, to folks that really have been very strongly impacted by the, the, the pandemic. If, if you look at it this way, women, um, SMEs, uh, the minority groups, indigenous groups, youth. So there's a lot of conversations and how whatever we do, how do we make sure that we increase inclusion and, fo and focus on sustainability. And um, the, the last uh, 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 pillar of the work or priority of, uh, of New Zealand's here is pursuing innovation in a digitally enabled recovery. And really that's, that's so, so true for all of us as, as we adjust and, and change our ways of interacting. And we've seen it last year and this year, and I think going forward a lot more that we've, we've got from our interactions using technology, uh, not as, you know, it's, it's not as how we, we used to be when, when you could hug each other and, and meet and have pull aside, you know, in meetings, having to adjust uh, in this environment and still deliver results is really what would um, help us to stand out in this, this difficult and challenging times. So, um, deliverables for this year, as I said, it's ongoing. We've been building on some of the areas that we started discussions on the past years. Uh, uh, for sure, we will have the implementation plan of the Putrajaya vision. You know, a vision is a vision, but if you don't have a plan to implement it, it's, it's, it's no use, right? Then we were, we are looking at finalizing the, the structural reform instrument uh, for the APEX uh, microeconomic reform work 21 to 25, looking at the food security roadmap, we're reviewing our APEX services competitiveness roadmap, the Cebu action agenda, this is the under the finance minister's process, and really at the end of the day engaging more with our stakeholders, whether it's the Business Advisory Council, whether it's the youth, the youth, we have dedicated initiatives, especially through the app challenge that we have. We work with the Asian Foundation to ensure that we engage the youth. And this year they've come up with uh, very interesting, innovative ideas about how to get the tourism sector going. So, you know, so harnessing those, the energy from the youth. Of course, there's a lot of work that's being done also on um, the, uh, the sector that's involved with women and the economy. So, so this, this are ongoing work and we hope to see a lot more uh, being done and to have um, you know, our support for the WTO continuing. And you will see this in our work on environmental goods, environmental services, the trade facilitation agreement. We wanna make sure we coordinate our, our efforts so that we have a concrete deliverable at MC12 when the ministers meet at the ministerial uh, meeting in, in, uh, in Geneva this year, towards the end of the year. Um, the customs, I must, I must credit the customs, our customs bodies across APEC for the work that they're doing to facilitate and distribute COVID-19 vaccines and, and related goods. I think this is one group that's doing concrete work and uh, we, they, they, really intense, intensely discussing how they can better facilitate the flow of essential goods and vaccines. So on that, uh, I, I'll end here and happy to take uh, questions later. But oh, before I end, I just want to make one final statement on the role of Peru in pointing our North Star. Our North Star is for regional economic integration is the free trade area for the Asia Pacific. We've got all these other agreements in place, but how do we ensure that we, boop, we pool all these efforts together? And in 2016, when, when um, Peru was chair of, of APEC, they 
not only had the this as an aspirational statement in the minister's declaration uh, in the leader's declaration they went one step further and actually had a specific declaration on the FTEP. And this remains our North Star. A lot of work in this area and, and we, you know, the, the work that's going on, whether it's bilateral and, and regional to be ultimately pulled together for us to uh, work towards the free trade area for the Asia Pacific. I think that's my, my last slide. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Santa Maria. Once again, thank you to all our speakers. We will now move over to the Q&A segment with Ambassador Ong moderating. We encourage our audience to participate in the session. Please post your questions via the Q&A function. The chat and the raise hand functions are disabled. Over to you, Ambassador Ong. Thank you, Nazia. Well, thank you to Peter, Carlos, and Rebecca for their respective presentation. I hope all our participants have a better idea of the respective areas which have been covered by Peter, Carlos, and Rebecca. Well, to start the questions and answers session, we already have a few uh, big questions, I put it, yeah. Um, maybe the first one I should uh, focus on is this uh, series of questions which I get on chat and also one of my a uh, good friend somewhere in ASEAN have asked me to repeat this question that he has always put at academic conferences on ASEAN and APEC, which is that we have talked so much about linking both Southeast Asia and uh, what we call Latin America, South America. Yeah, but over the years, not much has actually transpired according to various uh, questioners. So the first question is really, how do we do more? Uh, or maybe as a moderator, I should put it one step backward and say, what is hampering more connectivity and trade and investment flow between uh, our two regions? Uh, in this case, uh, uh, APEC members in uh, South America and Central America, namely uh, Mexico, uh, Peru and Chile and Southeast Asia. What are the main problem that we encounter or the business people or the companies have encountered? Maybe I start off with uh, uh, Rebecca. Give us your short and sharp uh, response and then uh, we can elaborate later as we go along this Q&A yeah. session. Yeah, I think that there are a couple of things here. One, there's the role of government in making sure that we facilitate the business, uh, looking at our rules, regulations, making it easier to do business. That's that's key to the role of APEC in our discussions among, among policymakers. Second is the business community themselves. So we have the APEC Business Advisory Council. How, um, and, and I must say that the Business Advisory Council has been very active in highlighting what they see as things that the policymakers can do more of. So really is that, that uh, collaboration between the two, uh, the government and the private sector, having those um, deeper conversations about what would facilitate the, the business. Uh, from, from our perspective, also working towards deepening regional economic integration is, is a, an important step. And, and I, as I mentioned, our North Star being with FDAP, now that's, that calls for a lot of work, a lot of uh, initiatives. And in, in, in the course of the work that we're doing, we also see how, like I said, trace facilitation for me is, is really key in this, in this whole, uh, context and the work that the customs, our customs bodies are doing, I, you you cannot ignore the work that they do. They're really working very hard to ensure that you know um, we look to using more technology to facilitate the flow of goods and and, and uh, especially essential goods during this pandemic time. So really, at the end of the day, it's about that collaboration uh, between the policymakers and the business community, understanding the needs and what more we can do. Thank you, Rebecca. Carlos, you like to respond to this set of questions? Please unmute yourself. Yeah, for, for example, in, in, in the case of Peru, it's a very interesting question. We need two things. Uh, for example, the, uh, in the case of Peru, we need better infrastructure. 
as you know, Peru have only one biggest port in, 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 in Peru, the Callao Airport, the Callao Port. But this port is already overcrowded. So we need another port. Happily, uh, there is a construction of a new port in Chancay. Chancay is 150 kilometers north of Lima. Cocoa shipping port, these Chinese companies going to put $3 billion and it's going to become one of the biggest port in the Pacific side of Latin America. So this is one thing. And another thing, of course, is a kind of policy, uh, government policy, really. I, I always say my students, I study in Japan, I always say my students, we need to look uh, to Asia, not only to take advantage of the biggest market to sell our goods, but also we should learn something from them, okay? For example, I always said 50, 70 years ago, countries very similar to Peru, like Malaysia, Thailand, they have a lower GDP per capita than Peru, but they have improved now. Now they are they are involved in the global value chain, regional value, global value chains in Asia. So we need a kind of industrial policy, okay? So we need infrastructure, we need uh, some industrial policy to attract investment, to uh, put more value added to our goods. And of course, we need, to promote more our image in Asia. Of course, it's very difficult, for example, to put trade promotion agencies in many countries in, in, in Asia because it takes money. For example, we don't have an embassy in, in Philippines, but we can work through the Pacific Alliance. In fact, in the Pacific Alliance, the four member countries are sharing uh, the cost to do, for example, joint promotion campaign to promote goods uh, service of the Pacific. So I think we need to work in these levels to really be more involved in, with the growing Asia Pacific region. Yes, thank you, uh, Carlos. I think the infrastructure and transportation uh, system across uh, ASEAN region, Southeast Asia, with your country, Peru, will be very yeah. important for us increasing the trade exchanges and also non economic and trade exchanges. Yeah. We have some students in Singapore from Peru, but I think overall, yeah, the often uh, cited reason for the uh, small number of uh, South Americans or Central Americans in Singapore is that the uh, traveling is not easy. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, I am sure that will also impact heavily on the business sector. But uh, maybe I should take this opportunity for you to say a bit more about the uh, uh, infrastructure plan in uh, Peru. You mentioned about the new port that is being uh, constructed. But we also read that Peru has a national infrastructure plan to systematically yes. expand all the basic uh, essential for uh, public transportation and also for the movement of goods and people. Uh, maybe you want to spend a one minute just to give us a bit more background on this uh, ah. Peru uh, government infrastructure plan? Yes, besides the construction of port, we need, for example, railways, okay? You know, railways have been one of the key ingredients for moving of goods in many countries. You take Japan, take China, for example. So still, can, can't you believe we don't have a, a, a national railway system? But we are going to build that uh, along the Pacific coast, okay? So 2,200 kilometers. So this is something that we have to do. And for this, we need investment from Asia. For example, Singapore is one of the uh, most, uh, I guess, uh, able countries to build infrastructure from also China and other countries. So I guess building ports, building railways will be a good thing to improve the movement of goods. You know, we have the jungle, we have the Amazonas, 50% of Peruvian territories Amazonas, but all these resources cannot be uh, useful because we don't have a, 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 a transport communication to go from Lima to Iquitos, the capital of the jungle, the Amazon, we have to take one hour by plane because if we go another way, it can take one day and a half. So we need, for example, that kind of thing. So I finished saying that in this field of infrastructure, Peru have so much to learn from your countries and for all Asian countries. Thank you, Carlos. Peter, um, there have been some references in our conversation so far about digitalization and the COVID-19 pandemic has really opened up more opportunity for uh, interacting and connecting to the various digital uh, platforms. Yeah. So as you talk about the uh, upcoming uh, FTA between Singapore and Pacific Alliance, and now we already have APEC and all the various digital program under APEC, uh, how much more can 
uh, we and Peru work together to strengthen the digital connection because, uh, well, the guys are, the construction guys are talking about constructing port and railway, but in the meantime, digitalization help us. Uh, can you uh, throw some light on what are the current uh, plans and what are the obstacles that you have with regard to this aspect of uh, connectivity? Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador uh, Ong. Um, well, as, as everyone knows, uh, we have a DIPA agreement uh, with uh, Chile, and one of our plans uh, is to expand this, this DIPA uh, agreement uh, to other members of the Pacific Alliance. With, uh, Explain DIPA. Uh, DIPA is the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement, mm. which uh, seeks to enhance uh, digital collaboration and uh, to grow the digital trade between uh, Singapore and Peru. Uh, uh, sorry, Singapore and Chile currently. So we plan to actually expand that to the other three members of the Pacific Alliance. And beyond the FTA, as I mentioned, uh, Ambassador, that we are also, uh, we, Singapore will become an associate member. Uh, in the context of the associate member uh, status, we are also seeking to uh, ascertain how we can uh, enhance uh, digital collaboration beyond the FTA rules. So that's another platform that we are seeking to expand our digital trade. But since I have the floor, can I just uh, add one other point, Ambassador? Yes. You, you use a very important word, connectivity. Uh, that is very significant uh, because we are two regions separated by the Pacific uh, Ocean. So connectivity is very important. Of course, air transport uh, services is important. But I think we shouldn't underestimate maritime transport services. 90% of global trade is today is carried by uh, maritime collaboration. And in that regard, I want to pay tribute to our Pacific Alliance uh, counterparts. Uh, the Pacific Alliance Singapore FTA is the first FTA that Singapore has, which has a standalone chapter on maritime transport services. So it seeks to enhance cooperation on maritime transport services. But beyond that, we are also going to the heart of people to people exchanges. And I mentioned about uh, in terms of promotion of exchange of students between maritime uh, centers of the Pacific Alliance and Singapore, and also exploring collaboration on mechanism to facilitate and promote onboard training for students on vessels. Okay. I think these are concrete actions uh, to promote uh, trade between us. And uh, as um, uh, Dr. Rebecca said, vision is important, but it's not sufficient. We need concrete, concrete actions. And in that regard, the International Maritime Transport Services Chapter is a concrete action. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. We have another question from a friend in Indonesia who actually asked, what benefit actually come from all these APEC, uh, FTA, uh, like CPTPP, and all these for the developing economy and the people of our region, both uh, Southeast Asia as well as uh, South and Central America. So uh, my suspicion is that we don't have enough information about what actually benefited our respective population. Yeah. My quick answer in the current uh, COVID-19 situation is that uh, this pandemic has brought us closer together and we now on both sides of the Pacific Ocean know a bit more about the what is available uh, to help each other. Uh, hopefully, we don't have any more obstacles that prevent more exchange of essential goods and personnel in tackling this uh, pandemic. But the actual question asked from our friend from Indonesia is what benefit has basically gone down to the people in the developing economies in our region? Maybe we can start the other way around. Uh, but since I have you uh, uh, on my screen, uh, Peter, you start the ball rolling. Uh, short one minute or two about uh, this particular question. What benefits have uh, APEC and all the other uh, economic integration and cooperation uh, uh, initiative we have in our uh, Asia Pacific uh, region? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ambassador. Uh, the way uh, we see it, uh, WTO, APEC are public goods. They help to en ensure the rule of law in international domain on trade. So that's, uh, so there's a rule of law, collaboration, cooperation, and those are important conditions for trade to even start. So, uh, well, uh, in that regard, uh, APEC has played a very important role, a sort of a pathfinder. And as, as, as it has shown over the years, 
The WTO has actually built on ideas uh, from APEC. So, but then the real actions actually lies with governments themselves, countries. So APEC and WTO can do that much, uh, common platform, rule of law. So then governments have to take advantage. And in that regard, the collaboration that we are doing with Pacific Alliance and Peru is a concrete example of how we are building on the platform that WTO and APEC has set. Thanks. Yeah, um, uh, Ambassador, if I, Ambassador Ong, if I could just add, I, I agree completely with what Peter has said. At the end of the day, as, as regional organizations, we, we share best practices. APEC is really that, that uh, a platform for sharing best practices. But at the end of the day, it's really up to individual economies to put everything in action. But I would just want to highlight one point here. When we talk of APEC and SMEs, the SME agenda, the MSME agenda, you must credit uh, Peru in, in the support that it gave to when Philippines here, yeah, Philippines um, was coming up with the Borokai agenda, uh, action agenda for SMEs, internationalizing of SMEs in 2015. There was this very, very strong support from, from Peru, which really saw that action agenda mal, uh, materializing, pushing, pushing, working closely with Philippines to push this agenda. And now it's an integral part of the work that we do in APEC, um, bringing SMEs together, providing opportunities for, for uh, you know, sharing best practices, building capacity. I think that's important. Uh, capacity building technical cooperation, which is the strength of APEC. Uh, on the government side, really at the end of the day, it's us in, in uh, policy makers looking at what we can do. There are all these, in, there are all these aspects out there, facilitative aspects, but if we don't take action to improve your infrastructure, there's no point. I mean, you can have the best trade agreements, but if you do not have a way for the products to go from point from the factory to the port, what's the point? You know, I mean, so it's not about the regional organization, but at the end of the day, when the where the rubber meets the road is at the national level, at the at the economy level, at the local level, you know. So that's that's a, the perspective that must be taken. We we do not hold the silver bullet. It is in the hands of the economies themselves. Thank you, Rebecca. Dr. Carlos, your reaction? Uh, please unmute yourself. I totally agree with what has been said by Peter and, and Rebecca, especially the last thing that said, Rebecca, we can have a, a free trade agreement that allow our country to sell any goods to another country, but we don't have the offer, we don't have the problem, we don't have the service, we will not take advantage of that. I will add just the following thing that I think has been touched already, but I will want to put more emphasis. You know, the APEC does not want only a uh, open system for trade and investment. It have also a very important component, the ecotech, really, the economic and technical cooperation. And they need, especially uh, the members, economies that are less developed, they should take advantage of the lessons of the help that the developed countries, developed members economies can do, really. So I need, I think we countries, developing uh, countries, we need to present more projects because the, 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 the structure is there, the system is there. But again, it is up to us to really take advantage of all the things that APEC can uh, benefit us. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, I have uh, always uh, thought that it's important for uh, people in our regions to be aware of one other important thing, multilateral trade and economic development revolve now around a lot of rules and regulations. And I think APEC and in the coming years, I believe uh, Pacific Alliance as well as CPTPP will all contribute important ideas like rules to facilitate trade into the WTO. And my researcher here just told me that uh, actually in the World Trade Organization Trade Facilitation Agreement, Many ideas originated from discussion at APEC and Asia Pacific uh, uh, discussion on freeing up trade and uh, facilitating trade. Yeah, so those things are important for our citizens and our small companies and any business people in our two region. Because if the barriers are there, the obstacles are there, and people don't facilitate 
movement of goods and people, then I think it is uh, not going to be uh, beneficial to our people down to the smallest company. So it is important not just to measure uh, what you can see. Many of these regulations and rulemaking, you cannot see. But we as a collective APEC or Pacific Alliance or ASEAN, yeah, and eventually CPTPP, we contribute ideas into the World Trade Organization and bring about better rules which help all our business people, big and small company, small enterprise, micro enterprises. Okay, um, there is another question just came in, is about how climate change, climate mitigation action, all these will affect this uh, vision and these plans that we have across the Pacific, uh, especially between say Singapore and Peru, uh, what kind of impact uh, the global attention or focus on environment and climate activities will have on all these trade agreements. Maybe I will start with Peter. Amu, please, Peter. The question is really how climate action will impact on our uh, APEC and other trade facilitation agreement, economic integration agreement. Peter? Okay, uh, thanks, Ambassador. The first point I want to say is that I want to disabuse uh, the often uh, cited view that trade is responsible for the climate problem. It is not. In fact, trade <laughs> can be a friend for the WTO. Uh, let me use the example of maritime transport again. Uh, as I mentioned, 90% uh, of world trade is carried by maritime transport. Actually, of all the modes of transport, maritime transport is the most cleanest form of uh, 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 transport in terms of the least carbon uh, emissions are uh, uh, contributed. So in that sense, trade is not the problem for the climate change. So the problem is, uh, is, uh, is actually we need to address uh, at its source, uh, like for example, burning of forests and things like that. Uh, but I want to just uh, to address the question. So what are the opportunities? So if I can speak in relation to the Pacific Alliance and Singapore, uh, Chile and Singapore are already exploring the possibility of hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen has a great potential as a renewable source that can cut down carbon emissions uh, significantly. So we are already having a conversation with Peru to explore uh, hydrogen uh, collaboration. And in fact, we are also discussing the possibility of expanding this to Peru, uh, Colombia, and Mexico as well. So hydrogen is one part. The other part that uh, the Pacific Alliance can play an important role vis-a-vis -vis Singapore in the climate challenge. Uh, I understand that the Pacific Alliance, the four Pacific Alliance states are quite advanced in terms of carbon markets and carbon credits. As you know, so Singapore as a country which is alternative energy disadvantage. Uh, so there is a nice nexus between us and the Pacific Alliance in terms of uh, Pacific Alliance being a source for carbon credits that we can purchase at cost efficient environmental integrity uh, to meet our uh, mitigation targets at the Paris Agreement. So already these are two specific examples where there's a scope of collaboration within the Pacific Alliance and Singapore. And on last point, uh, Dr. Rebecca mentioned quite at length about environmental goods. So the liberalization of uh, climate-friendly goods and services is one specific example of how all of us, all countries around the world, uh, can meet our climate uh, objectives, at the same time achieve trade and economic uh, objectives as well. Thanks, Ambassador. Thank you. Dr. Carlos, you'd like to add anything? Yeah, I think uh, in this regard, again, we can learn from uh, your country, for example. Really, uh, Singapore is a country that has no natural resource, even they didn't have enough water to, to themselves. They, they buy from another country, but now they are taking advantage, for example, from the sea or from the rain, for example. Another, for example, cause of so much contamination is that in many developing countries, like in Peru, as we don't have a good public transport system, people just want to have their own private automobiles and this causes contamination, cows, for example. No? So we need an efficient 
clean and on time public transport system and countries in, in, in Asia, like your country, I have been there, I have used it, public transport system, very good, Japan. So there are good practices already. So we can learn from these countries that are achieving a green economy, a circular economy, recycling. So Singapore in this regard, again, is a very good example that we can learn. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, I think uh, APEC has uh, many environmentally related uh, initiatives. Uh, yeah. Maybe this also yeah. linked up with the climate situation. Uh, maybe yeah, you I, want to I, say something? Yeah, I think we APEC started uh, way ahead. It, before it was fashionable, I think, to talk of it in, in uh, environment and trade. When in 2012, we, we, we had this agreement on um, uh, environmental goods. If you recall, the 54 uh, products that, that we finally had agreement on and you know to look at liberalizing for this and moved it to the WTO for further to make that an agreement uh, in APEC you know we don't sign agreements we just have collaboration around these areas so we the fact that we we push this agenda forward in the WTO is really kudos to to the members of APEC at that point in time 2012 um, when we did that and what we're doing now with the emphasis that we're placing on environmental sustainability in, in the APEC uh, vision going forward. So not just expanding the, the, environment, the conversation on environmental goods, but including in that conversation, environmental services. I think this, this, is, this is our way of really making it practical. You know, for the longest time, I remember when I was in trade ministry those days, um, it was not or de rigueur, you know, to, to put, environment and the conversation on environment and trade together you know but today you cannot not include um, issues of sustainability in trade and investment policies and even at the corporate level you will see esg being increasingly pushed um, for corporates to relook how they they how they do business so you know this conversation will continue and we will see greater emphasis on this going forward Thank you. Um, I think we are about to come to the conclusion of a Q&A session. Um, there are at least uh, one more question that I thought might be of interest. Yeah, and that is uh, for Peru and Singapore, how can we try to do more to attract common people from Peru and Singapore to visit each other? Yeah, this is something which uh, more what I call on the ground kind of uh, 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 interest and uh, uh, how, how can we do that? Uh, uh, one of my researcher in the RSIS suggested that we can uh, promote more tourism travel and all that, but now with the COVID-19 restriction, I think this idea has to be put on the cupboard first. Uh, but more importantly, how about also attracting uh, 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 exchange of uh, or movement of uh, skilled workers. So maybe, Peter, quick question, a quick answer, and uh, then we have Carlos and uh, uh, Rebecca. One minute each, then we move on to uh, uh, Ambassador Carlos for uh, closing up the uh, uh, this uh, live uh, session. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ambassador. I think the associate membership that Singapore will obtain and signature uh, will allow us to collaborate with Peru as well. Uh, so the associate membership will have, I believe, will have three pillars, political, economic, and cultural. So mm. from the cultural perspective, I think there's scope for exchange between uh, mm. Singapore and Peru in terms of Spanish language learning uh, students and so forth. I think that's mm. where we can start. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Dr. Carlos? Uh, yes. I, I guess, for example, talking about the CPTPP, there is a chapter on the temporal mm. Group of persons, so we should take advantage of that. Of course, there are some requirement, technical requirement, but we have to take advantage of that. There are uh, some industries, some service that can be uh, given to each country in both sides of the Pacific. So I think the framework was there, but again, we have to take advantage of that. Thank you, Rebecca. I just want to say that both Singapore and, and Peru are very active members of, of APEC. And uh, Peru specifically, you know, has, has done, has hosted APEC twice in 2008 and 2016. And, and they had this, this thing about doing it every eight years. So we're looking forward to, to seeing, uh, to, to see whether it, uh, you know, Peru can do it again in 2024. 
you know, so fingers crossed. But really, Peru has been an exemplary member of, of, the, of APEC uh, in the way it supported the various initiatives, whether it's FTEP, whether it's MSME agenda. So we, we in APEC, we're happy to uh, continue working with both Singapore, um, uh, Peru, as well as the Pacific Alliance. Not to forget ASEAN, of course. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends out there, I think there are one or two smaller uh, questions that I have uh, tried to integrate into the bigger inquiry that I posed to the three uh, experts. Uh, please forgive me if I have not been able to exactly pin down your specific details in your questions. But it is a good uh, discussion and I think we can do more of this kind of uh, interaction across the big, big Pacific Ocean, yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, all the problems that we have been talking about in maritime transportation and all that uh, 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 long-term issue that we have to resolve, uh, hopefully with the Pacific Alliance and Singapore FDA, we will have the impetus, uh, urgent impetus to do more. Uh, but uh, let me conclude this uh, exchange of views and ideas uh, and pass the screen now to uh, Ambassador of Peru to Singapore, uh, Ambassador Carlos. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to express my deep appreciation to RSIS and particularly its Executive Deputy Chairman Ambassador at large, Onken John for its valuable support to organize this webinar that commemorates the bicentennial of the independence of Peru and the excellent bilateral relations between Peru and Singapore in the last 40 years. Likewise, I would like to convey my gratitude to Deputy Ministers of Foreign Affairs, Ignacio Higueras from Peru and Ansim from Singapore for the encouraging messages to redouble our efforts to reinforce even more the magnificent relations we have built in the last four decades. The three distinguished experts in this webinar, Peter Govindasami, Carlos Aquino, and Rebecca Santa Maria, have highlighted the relevance of three multilateral initiatives to stimulate deeper links and integration between Peru and Singapore. The impending free trade agreement of the Pacific Alliance with Singapore, the CPTPP, and of course, APEC. Undoubtedly, all of them constitute complementary platforms that create fruitful synergies to enhance and upgrade our bilateral ties. However, it is very important to call attention to the international context in which we are going to navigate in the following years. The globalization we knew in the last three decades is being transformed before our eyes at a very accelerated pace. Four trends mentioned by the previous speaker will shape, in my opinion, the future of the international system. The strategic rivalry between the United States and China, the effects of the current pandemic on health systems and social tissues of all our countries that include, of course, the economic recovery that all of us are looking forward, the climate change that we need to mitigate, and the fourth industrial revolution that will hasten the development and consolidation of digital economy and digital governments. Most of these challenges are unprecedented and will require extraordinary measures to solve them on the basis of the widest international consensus to be lasting and effective. Along these lines, multilateral cooperation will be a key factor to pursue the common goal of promoting a just and inclusive recovery. The last decision made by G7 and welcomed by OECD of implementing, for example, a global minimum tax of at least 15% is an evidence of the need to assume multilateral commitments. Taking into account uh, uh, the very enlightened presentations made by my predecessors, I would like to stand out the following brief remarks. First, Peru was the last stronghold of the Spanish power in South America. It was required to defeat the colonial army that was deployed in Peru to ensure the independence of the whole region. On 28th of July, 1821, the Argentinian general, general Jose de San Martín proclaimed the Peruvian independence in the main square of the city of Lima. But the end of the colonial rule was definitely reached in the Battle of Ayacucho in 1824 with the collaboration of an army of soldiers 
from Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Venezuela. What I would like to emphasize is that regional cooperation was crucial for the independence of South America. Second, in the last 40 years, the cordial ties between Peru and Singapore have been based on mutual trust and a deep sense of cooperation. Though the main thrust of the bilateral relations is economic issues, multilateral cooperation has been a permanent feature of our common history. We are like-minded countries on topics such as climate change, maritime security, and the fight against transnational crime. The enhancement of our mutual collaboration requires us to diversify and widen our bilateral agenda. Third, like Peter Govinda Sami has mentioned, the agreement with Singapore as the first associated state of the Pacific Alliance represents a milestone, a significant building block in the direction of strengthening the links of the alliance with the Asia Pacific region. It will complement P4, the Peru Singapore FTA and CPTPP and will further economic cooperation in relevant issues such as energy collaboration, food security, digital economy, infrastructure, and as Peter Govindasamy has emphasized, maritime services. But the most important political message of this agreement in a world beset but I, by, by uncertainty is our reassertion to the principle of free trade. Fourth, Professor Carlos Aquino highlighted the CPTPP that CPTPP is the most advanced trade regional agreement in terms of ambitious standards, and its entry into force accelerated the signing of RCEP. He also said that most CPTPP countries were more resilient to the pandemic slowdown, and the agreement is a very effective platform to foster new value chains in the post-pandemic period, particularly for its Latin American members. Once Peru, for example, ratifies the treaty, it will have access to four new markets Brunei, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Vietnam, three of them in Southeast Asia. And finally, Dr. Rebecca Santamaria has referred to the relevance of APEC in the middle of the unparalleled challenges uh, we are facing. She mentioned that the public still associates APEC with support for free and open trade and interconnected global economy. And they believe that cooperation between economies is crucial to overcome the crisis, the crisis of the current pandemic. I was very glad to her that Peruvians in particular consider APEC as an effective platform to promote multilateralism. It is also very uplifting to verify that 2021 APEC priorities and deliverables are complementary with efforts in CPTPP and the Pacific Alliance, such as innovation and digitally, and digitally enabled recovery, a food security roadmap post-2020, safe travel and environmental goods and services. It is increasingly evident that uh, RCEP and CPTPP could be the building blocks of the future FTAAP, which is the ultimate goal of APEC. I think this webinar has been particularly relevant to assess the evolution of the relations between Peru and Singapore and the way in which the multilateral platforms examine on this occasion can boost cooperation between both countries. I am convinced that in spite of all the challenges we face, Peru and Singapore can expect another four decades of enhanced and brilliant cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Vasquez, distinguished mm -hmm. guests, ladies and gentlemen. This brings us to the end of the RSIS Embassy of Peru panel webinar. On behalf of RSIS and the Embassy of Peru, thank you for joining us this morning and have a good day ahead.